Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dia Talks Online. Uh, tonight's event is co-presented with Magazzino Italian Art. My name is Matilde Guidelli Guidi. I am Dia's associate curator, and I am very pleased to be joined tonight by Teresa Kittler, a professor in art history at the University of York and the 2020-2021 scholar in residence at Magazzino, for a conversation on the performative actions of Mario and Marisa Mertz in conjunction with the long-term exhibition of Mario Merz's work at the Beacon. Um, our conversation tonight draws from a number of archival sources, and before diving in, Teresa and I wish to express our gratitude to Luisa Borio, archivist at the Fondazione Merz in Turin, the Archivio Videoteca Giaccari in Varese, and the photographer Angelica Platten, and of course the warmest thank you to our colleagues who helped organize this event, um, Vittorio Calabrese at Magazzino, Andrea Villa, Molly Bernstein, Theodora Lang, and Max Tannon at DIA. And um, a little bit of housekeeping too, Teresa and I will talk for about 45 minutes and wish to leave, to leave ample time for your questions. So please feel free to drop questions as we go in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And a reminder that tonight's event is closed captioned and you will be able to activate the function by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screens. So now, Teresa, hello and welcome. Hi, thank you, Matilda. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening and to be in conversation with you. And we've had quite a lot of fun preparing for this event over the last couple of weeks. and. Um, the discussion that we uh, will have tonight is really um, a continuation of the conversations that we have had. Um, and just to reiterate uh, my thanks to Magazzino Italian Art and to Dia. I'm going to share my screen now. So perhaps a little bit of a preamble, um, I guess, as uh, while doing research for the exhibition currently on view in Beacon, I kept on stumbling upon images of Mario and Marisa uh, traveling, installing, or otherwise working together and activating each or modifying each other's work. And uh, several of the works that are currently on view at the Beacon kind of uh, testify to that collaboration and we have uh, on the left here on the slide uh, installation views that, uh, of the work of Mertz at Dia Beacon, of the Mertz's I should say. Um, we have Mario's spiral table uh, that hosts a material memory of uh, Mario and Marisa collaboration uh, and several times the table was installed by the two of them together and so we have uh, this beautiful uh, beeswax violin by Marisa and uh, at the right on the slide, there's a work that we will look at closely together today with Teresa. Uh, it's the sculpture titled Is Space Bent or Straight? With, uh, that contains a typewriter and that, as we will see in a moment, um, hosted a live uh, action uh, of Mario Marisa uh, sitting inside the sculpture and activating it uh, in various ways when it was first exhibited in 1973. So again, um, several of the objects uh, that we have on view uh, seem to put forth interesting questions in terms of the triangulation of the photographic record, the sculptural object, and performative actions. And of course, it's a conjuncture that uh, corresponds to a larger international trend emerging in the 1960s, uh, namely, the appearance of art photographers as either authors or witnesses, um, a desire on behalf of the artist to undermine the fixity of the object uh, by activating or otherwise demonstrating the contingency of the artwork, and uh, the uh, parallel rise of hybrid life practices. So perhaps before diving into the conversation, Therese, it would be interesting to um, given that we will use the term quite a bit to um, perhaps define what action meant within the context of Arte Povera. Yeah, absolutely. So as um, I'm sure you know, this, the term action 
is a sort of catch-all phrase or word for live works that are presented both inside and outside the art gallery. And as you, as you mentioned, it's one of a range of terms that come to the fore in the 60s to describe uh, a set of hybrid practices that come under this umbrella term of performance, so denoting um, the liveness of work, the physical presence often of the artist but not exclusively and the impermanence of the artwork and the term has a much longer history um, and in those histories Italian futurism so a movement that um, emerges in the early decades of the 20th century is credited as playing an important part um, if we think of the futurist serate or the futurist performance nights that um, comprise music sound uh, or noise and various lighting effects um, for dramatic effect and from uh, the outset Arte Povera is couched in many of these terms. So Germano Celant, the first, um, or the critic that is most closely associated with the movement, frames Arte Povera in relation to theatre, um, specifically the idea of poor theatre um, that had been put forward by the Polish director Jerzy Grotowski. So um, this idea of poor theatre was meant to hold on to the performativity of um, the genre, but without many of its trappings of um, costumes, etc., etc. Um, and we also find reference um, to terms such as action, theatre, event, also behaviour is another term associated um, in Germano Celant's writings and in his early statements on Arte Povera. And as you said, this goes hand in hand with the rise of art world photographers, and in Italy, um, uh, some of them most uh, famous names include uh, Hugo Mulas, uh, Claudio Abate, Paolo Musat Sartor, uh, Giorgio Colombo, um, th that contributed to the way in which such work was uh, recorded and circulated and even created. Um, and in recent years, the contribution of Arte Povera to our understanding of the history of performance has been foregrounded. There were a number of shows in recent years that really put that to the fore. And certainly within Arte Povera, there are artists that spring to mind or that immediately spring to mind um, that are in, um, invested in staging or kind of uh, theatre. If we think of um, someone like Pierpaolo Calzorari or in... Uh, live performance if we think of someone um, or um, someone like Michelangelo Pistoletto or Yanis Canellis or that cultivate the idea of the artist as persona so for example um, someone like Pino Pascali and I think what's been interesting to us as, as we've been speaking recently is is that neither Mario nor Marisa is obviously or necessarily associated with this term or it doesn't immediately come to mind and yet they've they have contributed to the, to the language of performance and to its history in some quite um, interesting ways. And I think that's, that's really the premise and, and the aspect that we've wanted to explore. Yeah, for sure. Um, certainly, I must say, um, it, was, it was a surprise to encounter these works and more of these, uh, you know, Photography, suites of photographs that really witness to a different life of the works as well as a different engagement with the public as well as a different activation of the sculpture. Uh, so certainly, yeah, as Teresa, you were saying, one of the goals tonight is to think through these suites of images together. And uh, one of the places we wanted to start because we realized that it becomes, it could be seen as paradigmatic of um, how Mario and Marisa differently uh, engaged the public um, uh, is precisely oh. <laughs> um, the this suite of photographs from 1973. Um, we see here the same artwork that is now in the galleries at the Abicon, and, and that contains a typewriter which still has actually a piece of writing by Mario, a sort of like prose poem or more kind of aphoristic. Uh, or almost like concrete poetry um, that really speaks to the question of uh, being unproductive 
uh, as well as, as in describing itself as a creative person. So it starts with an account of um, the uh, space uh, of writing as a space also for drawing, uh, but then also for poetry, and then uh, immediately uh, descending into a description of a refusal to produce. And what we're seeing here, and I'm going to look at all the images we have from the suite, is um, Mario sitting inside the sculpture. So the sculpture in this case becomes kind of the stage or the container uh, for the live presence of the artist. And uh, we see him, the, the sculpture again is titled Space Bent or Straight. This is kind of the quintessential form that Mario started using in 68. Uh, this hemispherical sculpture that has always this set of metal tubes, as we can see here, that support different materials, either transparent or opaque. In this case, really glass shards that are precariously held together. And sometimes there's neon writing, which really um, we, one of the things we looked at is how Mario's work always in, elicits action. So because of the um, centrifugal architecture of this sculpture, there's, uh, the viewer is usually put in motion and sometimes the, writing, the neon writing that is uh, wrapped around the sculpture elicits that movement even more. In this case, the um, the kind of the sentence associated or the question associated to the work is displaced to the wall, and uh, we and we can read uh, is space bent or straight? So a question as a kind of mode of address. But um, what we discovered is that not only Mario sitting inside uh, his own work, and I must say we are here at an art fair, uh, and this was I think we are all still familiar with. Uh, we have even though there's not. There's, not, there's no art fairs now because of COVID, but of course uh, we are all familiar with the architecture of the art fair, which is usually a gridded, organized uh, on a, according to a grid uh, with um, the booth of each gallery, uh, one after the other. So in this context, Mario and Marisa uh, that we see here knitting, and again, Mario reading or otherwise a performing kind of the poet, uh, and then um, a further image of their artist friend, Emilio Prini, who used to do work at this point in time uh, with uh, tape recorders, and we can see him uh, activating the tape recorder as well as like in floating in papers. Um, and, um, and here, yeah. No, no, go for it, go for it. No, just to say that the, the register is quite subtly, I mean, it's subtly different in, in the way that they occupy, they each occupy this space. And um, so uh, Marisa is knitting, or at least gives the impression of doing so. You can't actually tell from the photograph. Um, and um, so she's engaged in an activity that characterizes her practice, um, and by, by this point, she had been making work, um, uh, knitting work, um, using quite unusual materials like nylon and copper wire. And you see um, in the photograph this triangular frame that, um, that surrounds yeah, we her. we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what it was. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Which, I mean, it certainly evokes the, the presentation of many of her knitted works that often appear in these triangular frames. Um, but it, I suppose it also bears this um, a kind of reality um, to the me method of knitting in the round, which is something that she adopts, um, as we'll see in some of the uh, later photographs. And what's... Um, uh, What's apparent from this photograph is that her actions evoke a kind of uh, private setting, perhaps, um, one that's quite low key and that um, connects to the sphere of reproductive labor and the kind of politics of reproduction, which is quite different in a way to, to, um, to Mario Mertz's presentation, isn't it? It is, uh, and... Here we see him again, certainly. I think one of the things that became interesting to us when we were looking at this, 
and again as a question of like starting from this work is that it is so interesting how they clearly are performing both their work and you know as but also how they identify themselves as artists and their contribution to the larger cultural sphere at this moment so uh for mario even like sitting becomes like an action even if it's like a, a sit in or a peaceful you know protest um, absolutely whereas for example marisa's performance is silent and as yeah. is clear from the from the other photo her back is turned i mean we see that that view of her facing yeah. the corner of the room yeah. which is quite different i mean mario is, is facing outwards yeah. um very different and at the same time you know he's kind of the poet and she's instead precisely like this more like something that has been mentioned in uh, articles at the time penelope or association to this kind of more woman women's labor um but something that i think is very interesting is that the three of them in, and we include in this case also emilio prini um in this activation of the senses in particular the oral versus you know the primacy of the visual uh and marisa with this question of uh bringing in um self sustenance and self you know uh remaking yourself uh on a daily basis or what we call like reproductive labor and for mario this more cognitive or imaginative labor which is certainly not n- none of the three um or the three all of the three put themselves in um opposition to the economically saturated space of the fair and uh you would say normalize systems of value uh at this point in time so it is very interesting um both in terms of like how they inhabit differently which i think we will see throughout the talk and uh and also uh how at the same time even through the differences they are kind of united in opposing another force which we were saying is something that is particularly visible in the sculpture in how um the two ideologies uh are kind of uh almost putting pressure on the precarious uh glass uh of this uh construction uh yeah, absolutely yeah this this refusal on her part is absolutely characteristic of the way that um uh more broadly she refuses the language of art criticism of the institution of arts and i often think of um marisa as somehow acting up rather than acting so kind of not not playing by the rules and um i think what something that came out of our discussion um is that this we at first we kind of um saw it as quite kind of spontaneous or impromptu event but it turns out it's not quite as spontaneous or impromptu as we thought i mean obviously they each turn up with the props of their um of the the kind of performance or activity or or action yeah for sure and also this uh earlier image which we found thanks to um the archivio videoteca jacari uh of a sculpture the same sculpture but in an earlier stage of you know uh finish that uh earlier in the year 1973 uh we see like the shadow of Emilio Prini it's unclear i mean he's inside but of course the 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 video captures him almost as a shadow inside the sculpture so certainly um you know they went prepared <laughs> to the art fair <laughs> um and i must say that um there are newspapers clippings that uh show them they made the first page of the uh, newspaper that week but uh because of the again the kind of live presence uh, more than the discussion of the artwork per se um so the other suite so if this suite of photograph to us was interesting because again of like setting the stage of the different personas and how uh the sculpture became the stage uh we wanted to look at this other suite of photographs which actually in this case the photograph or the document of the um action uh is the artwork and we are looking here at a detail of a suite of 11 photographs 
of a work by Mario Mertz. Uh, that uh, there, there exist several iterations of this work. This is how it is presented. So the suite of 11 photographs and then the Fibonacci numbers numbering uh, them. And uh, what the evolution that, they, that the suite maps is um, a sequence of workers occupying or people occupying tables. So in this case, we are in, in a canteen uh, of a factory in Naples and uh, we see that there's a single person and then incrementally there's more people and therefore more beers and therefore uh, there needs to be more space. So this um, was interesting to us because of the uh, how it's one of the few instances in which the photograph not only documents the action but also turns and the action turns the tables into a sculpture if you want or a stage uh, but then at the same time the um, the photograph becomes uh, an, an integral part of the artwork which uh, is something that is quite different from what we will see uh, later yeah and the, the very kind of public setting of the work or the public address um, you know, these works are put into circulation. They're exhibited as works, right? Yeah. And, and in it, this case, the artist is not here, but uh, the, the people make the work by populating the tables. And uh, something that we were saying is interesting, of course, the places that he chose are all places of sustenance and sociability. So either restaurants or canteens or a London pub across Europe. Um, and you were saying, Teresa, is something um, brought to mind an association to, again, questions of labor and traditionally. And, and exactly, and the politics of labor, and that comes through in some of his other works as well, you know, the kind of propositions that, um, or uh, questions that he asked, the que fare, the stodiela, you know, this, this. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think it's interesting, of course, these are all moments uh, in this case for the factory it is of course a moment of it's still within the schedule of the work day um, but and you know the time allotted for the lunch break so it's still part of this overarching structure of labor extraction and value extraction but at the same time it's a moment in which it's uh, convivial and sociability and it also the people regenerate themselves uh, but um Again, to contrast this moment in which the photograph becomes the artwork, we wanted to look at this amazing suite of photographs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, which is quite so, different. So these are photographs that were taken by Claudio Bate, so one of these um, photographers that was gaining... Um, uh, kind of gaining recognition in this in this period and has, has since um, become associated with the way in which we've received Arte Povera um, and it was a, a series of photographs that was taken in 1970 so on the occasion of Marisa Mertz's exhibition at uh, Fabio Sargentini Lattico Gallery a gallery that becomes very much associated with um, with performance and actions I mean um, we were thinking about some of the works, weren't we, that, that come out of um, that gallery, some of the most iconic works, uh, uh, Robert Smithson's Asphalt Rundown and um, various others. And it's on the occasion of her uh, exhibition um, that she um, uh, performs one of these so-called actions um, by taking a ride over Rome um, with the pilot that you see in this small Chesna plane. And the photographs that were taken uh, record or document the production of the work. Um, so she dictated her altitude during the flight over Rome via radio to Fabio Sargentini on the ground. And the photograph of the graph uh, you see on the right um, was displayed in the exhibition, but the other photographs weren't circulated. And um, we picked out some of the details, some of the very small details in that photograph, the, the height that they reached of 10,000 feet um, before they started their descent. So uh, 
exactly you know, um, where the, um, the, the thank you to Fabio, um, her gallerist, and then in the bottom right corner, the um, they um, write, so we're on the River Tiber or above the River Tiber, 30 kilometers from Rome. So, um, so playing with the language of conceptual art very much yeah, so. Absolutely. And there's, a, yeah. a, I think there's also. Shall we move to the following slide? Yeah, absolutely. And there's certainly a proximity and closeness with the photographer um, in um, in this photograph. I mean, it's it's quite an amusing photograph, and I think Marisa at her most unguarded, or a rare occasion of her in front of the camera, um, and also suggesting this quite playful side to her. Um, so she is smoking a cigarette. I think you can just see um, under a sign. Uh, that reads no smoking and um, and here in the photograph on the on the right we get an insight into how the work was displayed in the gallery um, uh, I mean how the the work that was displayed in the gallery was made um, we see Fabio Sargentini Mario um, Mario Mertz um, with this easel on which they record her altitude an easel on which they make this work of conceptual art um, and um, yeah, if we go forward, perhaps, yeah. It's, it's, but it's a, it's a private action. It did not have an audience beyond this very small, intimate grouping um, of gallerist and friend and partner and photographer. And, you know, as we've said, the photographs were not meant to be circulated, and nor have they until much more recently when um, photographers like Claudio, Claudio Abate have been the subject of exhibitions in their own right. Um, yeah, which certainly to us again was interesting because um, as we sat with the first work that we were looking at, the performance in Berlin, uh, you know, certainly there's a difference also in terms of temperament of the, of the two artists and, uh, but for sure, uh, in this case, again, the, the suite of photograph kind of document the action that leads to the artwork, but uh, as you said, were not really exhibited, just as this other suite of images. And perhaps even this brings us in, is in another direction even, because it may as well be that actually it was Claudia Bate that uh, asked Mario Marisa to bring their works out. Although we have some thoughts about this. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um something that came out of the research on um, Claudia Bate's uh, exhibition a couple of years ago that this was a work that he proposed um, so it's taking place just outside of Rome again on the, the same the occasion of uh, Marisa's exhibition um, of her work at the Galleria Latico and so what she brings to the beach um, are those works that she had knitted out of nylon thread the little shoes. Um, uh, she made a number of these um, that were exhibited in the gallery. Um, the letters that spell out the word Bea, um, the diminutive of her daughter's name, Beatrice, and uh, the work on the right, which is titled O on the ground. Um, and of course, these are gorgeous, like very marketable and romantic images, you know, of the work uh, and the texture of the photograph, of the sand and the long shadows. Uh, but, and we can see, oh, maybe it's not. Uh, one of the things we were saying is that they also correspond and we will see in a minute another suite of images taken that same day here in which um, it corresponds to a moment in which both Mario and Marisa are, and I think that's something that continues in the life of, in the career of Marisa, an interest in bringing the work outside of a predetermined context. And Absolutely, yeah, those were her, they, exactly, those were the, the words that she used in, in an interview in relation actually to another, um, another work, uh, her living sculpture, um, but I think uh, in the same way here, there's this um, experimentation with uh, uh, placing 
her sculptures in an outdoor setting and, and what this confers on the work. Um, those uh, three works on the on the um, sand, the the scarpette, the um, the letters exactly B and on the ground uh, gain a sort of kind of organic quality or character almost as if the, the works have been thrown up by the waves and, and certainly in the writing writing um, on her work and on these works of references or associations to, to, to see sponges abound um, and as you alluded to it's, a, it's certainly a way of adding or exploring a new dimension to the sculptural object, to the artwork, um, and to a broader phenomenon of seeing a work outside of, of a gallery context and the effects of this mood on our experience of the work as sculptural work, which I think in this case um, lends the work their sense of impermanence. Um, yeah, so and opens so up to so many associations for sure. Uh, and this was a picture that we added just because uh, it demonstrates also a desire to see the work in nature, which is something that uh, Mario had also tried uh, earlier on. Uh, this is a, a piece of wax that was cast essentially as the negative shape of between two branches. And here we see him carrying the work. But I think another thing that we were saying that is interesting, again, in relation in terms of the relationship between the two and then to the photographer and the publicity. I mean, Marisa is not here. These are the works that just as the graph that we saw earlier, the coperte, the blankets, were actually the work that was then exhibited at Latico. But here we see them as in their full physicality. And uh, Mario is like having real trouble yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> managing them. Yeah, you really get a sense of the work's weight here and awkwardness um, or awkward size. Um, there's, there's also um, this sense of, well, I mean, in the same way, the, these works were not performed for an audience. They weren't, you know, um, they're photographs that correspond to the a kind of secret life or private life of the work. So these actions without an audience except the artist or, and the photographer, um, their actions for the camera alone that afford Marisa the possibility to experiment with her work and really to bring, bring it to life in, in a certain way or a day in the life of the work. Um, particularly in, these, in this kind of series um, or set of photographs that we see um, uh, one next to another, the, the, um, the, the kind of narrative that's created through that sequence but, um, uh, and the, the sort of uh, kind of narrative that's created through this, um, this uh, shot of, of Mario Mertz with this kind of strange found object on the ground that kind of is, uh, evokes the, the, the blankets that he's holding, um, which, as you said, really gives a sense of their physicality. Um, Mario's kind of almost thrown off balance here as he tries to kind of reposition these works on his shoulder and there's this there's a kind of um, echo here of another photograph that was taken from a couple of years earlier in Mario, Mario's exhibition at the same gallery where he's also photographed walking in the in the opposite direction facing the camera uh, but with the the three blankets uh, wrapped up on his shoulder and um I think the setting here is also kind of interesting. I mean, without kind of over determining the work, um, a, a critic that was very close to the couple for a time, Tommaso Trini, had spoken about the kind of the sea as a sort of metaphor um, for Marisa's way of working, for um, the idea of a work that gets uh, or that gets lost and, and found in distant views, but also of a kind of metaphor for the infinite task of making. And um, I think this sense of continuity or the task of constantly remaking her work um, has often been picked up in the commentaries around um, her, the, the work that goes by the name of living sculpture. Uh, it's a title that, that she doesn't give to the work, but that the work takes on. Um, and um, it's a sculpture that uh, continues to grow 
as I think this photograph taken in her home um, so powerfully captures. So we see it competing <laughs> with um, the rest. Totally of, taking yeah. it over. I mean, I sh we should say because it's um, we are really into the image here, but so moving into these images now again, we wanted to look at how all of a sudden it's the work that is becoming kind of the protagonist of the action, if you want. Uh, and again, the photography documents it. Uh, what we see is actually the Merce's apartment and uh, the Marisa's untitled living sculpture that Teresa, you were just describing, is here fully expanding and uh, growing to take over. Um, totally engulfed the space. This is another suite of images in color. Um, we see again the work on the left on the uh, surrounding the television set. There's um, another a work by Mario. This was their apartment. Uh, we have this circularity. We come back to the typewriter, which is of course probably Mario's table, but it's not only Mario's table. Clearly we see the living sculpture is here. Uh, for those who have seen the show at Dia Beacon, they will recognize this work, which is actually currently on view, <laughs> of course, in a completely, uh, yes, uh, and as well as a shell, or better said, uh, the understructure of one of the dome sculptures. And here again, we have their kitchen, and again, the living sculptures naked in and out, as well as their stove, in which yeah. you can see she makes this quite powerful association um, um, or talks about the ma making that work as, as registering the time spent caring for her daughter, which really kind of quite powerfully brings to the fore the kind of labour involved in that task, as we were briefly talking about um, earlier. And I think also what's... Um, What's, uh, I mean, it's anecdotal, but it's kind of amusing. This um, Be Beatrice, her daughter, is quoted as saying that she'd been frightened of the work when she was little. So you really <laughs> get bet. this sense of, you know, the work competing and engulfing that space. Um, and creating these, you know, shadows and reflections. And, uh, and I think a nice, maybe, yeah, a nice passage was for us looking at these images of the of course work in the interior and like and how this very private setting becomes actually the image that is used for a poster for actually the work again to yes to so take it, its it, own yeah ex yeah exactly it's a photograph that was taken on the occasion of or um in just before her work is exhibited at the Piper Pluri Club, which is one of the kind of early iterations of this work. Um, and here you see the um, invitation card. It's quite a, a, a blurry um, image, but you can just make out this, this reference to the worker or this description of the work as, a, as an environment. Um, and um, so... So the, the Pluri photograph Club was essentially like a... Um, a social club or a, a yeah. discotheque? Yeah, it was a nightclub. It was exactly a disco, exactly. And it was one of the kind of um, genres of... Uh, uh, architectural genres that really took off in the 60s thanks to uh, a number of uh, courses that were run in Florence um, by uh, the architect Leonardo Savioli. Um, and this club was designed by... Um, Gruppo Strom um, and one of the, the um, uh, architects associated with that group also then goes on to um, to kind of manage um, uh, the club and in, invites a series of artists associated with Arte Povera. So again, you get this really this real sense of the kind of liveness of this uh, milieu, both within a kind of um, uh, architecture but also um, film and all this experimental um, activity that's going on and it's one of a series of nightclubs that kind of cropped up in Italy in this period um, and um, here the work uh, forms part of the decor or setting and it kind of really I'm, I'm it's 
uh, the idea was to transform that space and transform the architecture of a space that was in part defined or meant to be transformed. It's, it's uh, designed to be flexible and um, was part of a kind of broader understanding of these kinds of um, flexible spaces associated with experimental architecture, um, which, through their which through that flexibility were meant to empower their inhabitants, so to actively shape that space. And um, here, the attendees of that, I mean, it's this uh, environment, this uh, event also, um, because there's this, um, uh, exactly this night that was associated with it, with it um, become the kind of performers against this backdrop rather than the audience, right? And certainly in the reception of the work, it's characterized as a happening. Um, by an artist who'd just come back from the States, so is very much versed in, in, that, in that language. Um, Piero Gilardi, who talks about the incense that was uh, uh, infusing the space and the music and the flowers, and, uh, to, and really gives this sense of the kind of spontaneous nature of it all. Um, and in that same year, it takes on a very different form again, where it, it sort of, it's not just the setting or as kind of um, disrupting the architecture of the space, but it's really uh, brought to life. Um, and it's brought to life through film and it was conceived as a kind of protagonist in the film in, in a really kind of spectacular way. So what you're looking at are, are the um, a number of stills taken from uh, a film that was directed by Tonino de Bernardi and Paolo Menzio, so friends um, and um, certainly belong to that milieu of artists associated with Arte Povera. And there's these, again, another a wonderful anecdote of um, Tonino de Bernardi who talked about um, really conjures that image that we just saw of Mertz's home, yeah. of, the, of, the, of um, this sculpture, uh, of her, the living sculpture completely invading that space. And As so, with monstrous overgrowth. Yeah, absolutely. And he turns that sculpture into a monster in this film. It's a really strange film, um, very much of its <laughs> moments, quite difficult yeah. to watch in places. Um, the, so the short, what we're seeing here, just for like, for me, to, like we have like a split screen essentially, and on one hand there's like the activity of this green monster, which gives the title to the film, and then in intersecting with instead Marisa's living sculpture, which, as we can see progressing, is almost like uh, cannibalizing the yeah, uh, living beings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you see these, it's difficult to tell, but you have these, these two screens side by side. On the one side, you have this perspective of the, of the monster, kind of um, the monster's perspective. And on the inside, you have the insides of the monster, which, um, so Marisa's sculpture is turned into the insides of these, this monster. Um, and um, it's, uh, yeah, d kind of engulfing the, the protagonist. And it's, it really um, uh, kind of, you can see the way in which the filmmakers kind of actively trying to bring the sculpture to life through these kind of strange stagings that also correspond to kind of uh, uh, interactions with sculpture that we see in this period more broadly. Right. Which again is a very different question. I mean, if we saw the sculpture serving as stage, we saw the sculpture serving as shelter, we saw the sculpture serving at the core, but we are entering here as a series of works. And I, I think, you know, it, it was liminal already in the Piper Club, but um, where the sculpture changed in a way the people around it by transforming them in equally, rather than being a prop or a stage, it was this hybrid situation in that demanded interaction or kind of uh, maybe even uh, taking down the boundaries between the subject and the object. And here we can see how it brings it to another level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally another level. Yes, yeah, so um, the, those protagonists are wearing the sculpture or kind of, you know, wrapping themselves <laughs> with it. Um, exactly. And it's, it's, I suppose, the most kind of spectacular um, realization or manifestation of the work um, and so so different to La Conta that was the, the work that we saw right at the beginning um, absolutely and um, 
of which we're seeing just a, a number of um, stills from that or, or um, screen grabs of that. And, and actually it was, it was um, presented, so presented at a, a kind of a event or an evening um, of films in which Tonino de Bernardi, another film by Tonino de Bernardi, would shown on the last day of an exhibition um, of Michelangelo Pistoletto's work at Fabio Sargentini's gallery in 1968. And um, so this is Mertz performing for the camera, but in a characteristic way. It's a silent film, as some, you know, the. Um, a number of, part of, uh, of the audience members here were kind of questioning about the lack of sound here, sort of deliberately silent um, film. Um, uh, it's a film it's in a very, way about repetition, right? Right. So something that we see here just, so she's actually opening, the, the film is called La Conta, which means counting, and we see her opening a can of peas, nothing more banal than that, oops, and uh, she's here opening it, she drains the water, and once these two operations are accomplished, the rest of the film is just she uh, repeating the same gesture until the can of peas is open and the plate is therefore full, but of course, um, yeah, we were saying I can't help, especially going through these images that give us a little bit of a glimpse of Marisa's, um, as you were saying earlier, like unguarded, uh, especially the earlier images at the airport are kind of wit. Uh, and I can't help seeing this as kind of a uh, internalization of repetition, uh, seriality, as well as, um, you know, reproduction, but with uh, a very deliberate, almost mockery of it because of the yeah. uh, she's absolutely kind of she's absolutely deadpan isn't she right right um, and it's so, deliberately low key and you get a glimpse of the sculpture that you know she'd already started making um, in her Turin studio that's starting to to creep creep up behind her and um, I just want to see if we have any questions, because I realize that it's already... Uh, but in order to see it, I think I have to take down... to stop sharing. Uh, stop share. Sorry about this. Um, Okay, so we actually don't have any questions just yet. I'm sure they will come in, but maybe maybe I can, yeah. Um, maybe we can return. To La Conta. So that was quite interesting, actually. So do you know whether when it was exhibited, was it like part of like an evening of films or yeah exactly that was held over a month uh, well it was the last day of a month-long show that um took place um from the t i mean it's from the 12th of february to the 12th of march 1968 and it was an exhibition of michelangelo pistoletto's works and this was um the last day of um that exhibition and so marisa mertz I think showed this film, but then we have Tonino de Bernardi, Plinio Martelli, Ugo Nespolo, who also um, we associate um, with a number of uh, uh, films and videos of, of uh, uh, arte, uh, artists associated with Arte Povera. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, it's just such a contrast and such a kind of deliberately low-key um, performance that it's quite interesting that this, um, you know, that, that this in, in a way is one of, you know, when Marisa chooses to, to be in front of the camera or yeah. deliberately chooses to be in front of the camera. So I have a question. Um, we have a question coming in, uh, actually a number of them. Uh, 
I have a, somebody, one of our uh, listeners, I have a question about life sculpture. Beside living bodies interacted with an installation, can we also refer to a live element growing in a work? Let's say a plant, part of work, which also continues to change to better understand the concept. Well, <laughs> I mean, certainly, yes, plants were used quite a bit uh, or fruits and vegetables, the table that we saw at the beginning that is now on view at the Abicon, um, if the table was um, a form that Mario explored throughout uh, and starting with this question of uh, how many people, what is a real sum of people rather than just an abstract number, but like uh, how much space do we have to account for and, uh, and according to the number of people who are present, who are eating, who are drinking, etc. But I think by the time we get to the late 70s, early 80s, the table is kind of reconceptualized as kind of an elevated portion of the ground. And uh, the, the spiral table that we saw uh, hosts uh, quite often, routinely hosts um, installations of fruit and vegetables, which of course uh, literally have to be changed uh, yeah. in order because they deteriorate. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in the case of this this work, the living sculpture, I mean, this it, it gains this kind of biological uh, kind of metaphor or analogy. Um, I mean, the work was sim. I mean, the work, the the process of making the work was fairly straightforward. It was just um, Marisa cut strips of this aluminium material. And then looped it together, and then looped another another strip over that. So slowly creating this this tubular form. Um, I think you know the idea of its liveness is um, evoked through this cumulative effect of the work. The idea that it 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 continues to grow. I mean, quite literally in size. Um, the idea that it's it's um, the way it's exhibited is not predetermined. Um, I mean, also in one of the early exhibitions um, of her work at the Jan Inzospir on a gallery, um, and um, a poster is created for that exhibition in which the sculpture is actually hanging from a tree. So I think this, these associations with growth are, are also con I mean, they're kind of conjured figuratively um, in terms of the staging. I don't know if that yeah. answers the question. It does. Uh, so I think we have, oh, of course, now we have a lot of questions coming in. Mario's work sometimes referred to guerrilla warfare and the Italian partisan. Can some of Marisa's work also be identified as cultural guerrilla? Um, I mean, I think I think so, very much so. But in a, I think the dichotomy or the uh, kind of two-headed uh, uh, language that the two of them use, I think they're both certainly not with the activism or more like act action inducing uh, emphasis of Mario but I do think um, in a less maybe um, how would I say declamatory way but certainly both both of them like even this work once again like I feel like it it, it just summarizes everything that is going on in terms of on one hand, you know, the politics of the alienation of the laborer from <laughs> its own repeated work, but also bringing in the question of the politics of the uh, domestic labor. Uh, and then at the same time, in terms of the language of art at this moment in time, the kind of the dead end uh, of the of seriality and, uh, you know, the monotony of it, uh, but also brought in contrast, you know, the, if you think of the seriousness sometimes of a more kind of erratic nature um, and serious nature and self-sufficient nature of even minimalist sculpture or 
um, what we see here is kind of using that same language of repetition, reproduction and seriality and uh, implying uh, instead a much more, uh, how would you say, uh, private and uh, realm of it and uh, a kind of a contrast that is so immediate that inevitably debunks the seriousness of the others. Um, okay, I see a lot of questions. Oh. Uh oh. Yeah, just to reiterate, your, I mean, Matilda's point is never, you know, never explicitly um, uh, uh, adopts a kind of political uh, language or rhetoric. Um, I mean, but I think we can see how work is challenging certain, certain, um, certain conventions about um, about the home and. Um, even what it is to be an artist. Yeah. So I, the other questions, uh, I guess we can fill them in otherwise. I feel that uh, I have to thank you now, Teresa. We are uh, at our hour mark. And this was really wonderful, especially, you know, getting to see this super rare material together and think through these questions. Uh, so I hope uh, everyone enjoyed and Again, thank you very much. Um, and sorry for, I hope you could hear part of my answer earlier on. <laughs> I think my uh, headphones just failed me. Yeah, we got the answer. I think we got most of the answer, Matilda. Thank you so much, Matilda. Thank you for joining us tonight.